Um, so today I want to open up with a story that I read this week, and um, it, I should have known because I watched the movie and they have this scene in the movie, but uh, I read an article both in a Parade Magazine, Leadership Magazine, where it talked just about this one particular story of Jackie Robinson. And if you all know, Jackie Robinson was the first African-American uh, baseball player and was playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers when they were in Brooklyn, not in uh, not where not the uh, not the LA Dodgers, but the Brooklyn Dodgers. Um, before they moved over there, and when he got there, it wasn't the most smooth. It, he wasn't most welcome. In fact, he dealt with a lot of vitriol and rage about him. They didn't like him there. Uh, it, there are stories of. Um, Spiking on the base, on the bases, brutal epitaphs being posted on dugouts from the crowd, and one particular game while he was playing, he made an error, and it was an error. He didn't make a mistake, and the fans just absolutely ridiculed him. They just went after him unstop, and and they were they were using uh, profanity, racial slurs, and he just felt humiliated. In the midst of this moment where he just, he's on the edge. This one guy, another Dodger from the South named Pee Wee Reese comes alongside of him, puts his arms around them and looks at the crowd and said, this is my buddy. This is my friend. And the crowd went silence. And Robinson would later on tell that that moment really saved his life. It really saved his, his career because he was on the edge. And we need friends like a Pee Wee Reese in our life. Because there's going to be a moment where we're going to be like Jackie Robinson. The world's going to come crashing and we are in this strange and foreign land, and we need someone who can come alongside you and say, no, this is my friend, back off. Or this is my friend, and let me help you. And often, in this world, we don't find people like that. Often we're filled with acquaintances in this world, and, and we know one or two good friends in Christianity, in, in, in Christ, that should not be the case. In Christ, it actually should be different. In fact, in Christ, we should be surrounded by people like this, and good fellowship who come alongside us in difficult times. And as we continue our journey in 1 Peter, standing firm in faith and in, in grace, we want to look at this sermon titled, Love One Another. Love one another in 1 Peter 22 to 25. And in it, we're going to see three things. And as Mark said, a lot of it is going to have to do with the word of God. But the first part is the loving word, the transforming word, and enduring word. The loving word, the transforming word, and enduring word. The word of God is key to creating this kind of fellowship. And let's take a see in how it relates. Loving word. Let's read verse 22 again. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purify your soul for a love of brothers without hypocrisy or sincerity, fervently loving one another from the heart. Now, when we read this, and we, we read this first time, we, we run across, Peter says this odd phrase, Obedience to truth to purify your soul. And like, if you're paying attention, like, whoa, whoa, Peter, time out. And, and, and Peter does this a lot. He says stuff, and we're like, whoa, whoa, Peter, what's going on here? And he's not saying that we're being saved by being to truth. We're not being saved by works righteousness. I mean, because we know, as Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says... For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourself. It is a gift of God, of, uh, not of works, so that no one boasts. We know this is true. So clearly Peter can't be talking about this. And the key to understand this, what is this obedience he's talking about? 
You need to go earlier on. Those two of the last verses went over last week. And the last two verses we went over last week was talking about this. He was foreknown before the foundations of the world, but appeared in this last time for the sake of you, that through him as a believer in God, you raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. And then you read, since you have a obedience to the truth. What is the truth that you're being? It is the gospel. The gospel is the truth that you're being, that the gospel has been presented to you, you've heard it, and you respond. The obedience is you respond. You said, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And you understand it was by grace, not by works, that God chose you and called you, and you, you responded, and the Lord, and you, the, you made the Lord Jesus your Lord and Savior, and you repented of your sin, and you repented and believed in Jesus. And through the process of salvation, through the process of, of the gospel, that is how you're, you purify your soul. And so that was the being. The being was you responded to the gospel. So with that now lay, as we talked about last week, part of purification leads to a change mind. Obedience, holiness, reverence for God. And for the last few weeks, we've been talking how not only does it change, we've been talking about how it changes our vertical relationship. It changes how we see God. We have a reverent fear for God. We have a love for God. We have a hope in God. And now as we move on to this next part of verse 1, we've been talking about now, in this last couple of verses, this horizontal relationship. That our vertical relationship with God will naturally change our horizontal relationship. And you do not have one with the other. If your vertical relationship with God isn't right, then your horizontal relationship will won't be right. And you could try to work on a horizontal without God, but you will fail. And that's part of what this passage, as you will see, is about. For as Peter explained, the true purifying of your soul for love of the brothers. In other words, our sanctification in Christ leads to a love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. The word for love here is this, this word that we know very that that we've heard before is Philadelphia. And in fact, there's a there's a Philadelphia in Revelations. Now, when we think about Philadelphia in the United States, we don't I don't know about Philadelphia, and I definitely don't think when I think of Philadelphia, I don't think about brotherly love. But the word Philadelphia really means brotherly love, or as you can say, sisterly love. And it's a love that is a deep affection. Oh, it's cold there. It's a deep affection. Like if we saw each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, and those who are older than us, we treat them as our fathers or mothers in Christ. And those younger than us, we treat them as our sisters and brothers. That the church should be a big church family, and that one of the things I love when we have our potlucks and we go down, it's like a family get-together. And as Peter wants to understand, that we need to see ourselves as a family. That we're not just individuals, that we're not just part of a club that meets every Sunday and sometimes on Wednesday. But we're not a club, but we are a family that gets together and longs to be with one another. For we all have been adopted in Christ, and we all cry out, Abba, Father. And so now we give this idea of this brotherly love, and then he says this idea of without hypocrisy or sincere faith. Now, it's, hypocrisy is probably a better word for here. Sincere is good. It comes from this Greek word. I'm, 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 you're going to get your Greek words in for this week, just if it works. Uh, you're going to get your Greek words in hypocrisy, and it uh, basically means uh, 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 hypocrite and atopokitos. This is your, you got your Greek words for this week. You can remember, I'll quiz you later on, though. No. But, but, 
basically it, it is this idea, have you ever in Greek, in Roman times, you would have these plays. And in these plays, they would wear these masks and they would switch between masks when they play different characters. And so they were, you, you, they were considered hypocrites because their face, you never saw what they really were. They would wear one mask and they would switch to another mask. And these masks would tell you how the actor was acting. And if we were to use a modern day analogy, it would be two-faced, you know. Now, if you told someone that you're a two-faced person, is that a compliment? No. What are you telling them? They're, they're a liar, that they're not honest, they're not straightforward. They're being two-faced. And so what he's saying is, in this analogy, he's saying you should be genuine with your brotherly love. That your brotherly love should not be false. It should not be an act, but a real thing that you really do love this person, that you really do care about someone. And one of the things that is uh, the un unbelievers out there find very compelling or can find very compelling is a genuine person. Because out there in the world is full of fake people. They're all trying to wear masks. They're all trying to be something else. They want to be what the world wants them to be. And in the church and here, all those masks should fall down, and we should be able to be who we want, who we really are, and we should really love people as they, we really love them, that we are authentic. And one of the things that the world is looking for is authentic faith, a real faith, something that, wow, you guys really do care about people. You, you don't just pretend to care about people, but you really do care about people and this is the idea he's trying to get apart now then he goes and he talks about a um, a fervent love a fervent love now earlier I, I, I when we talk about a philadelphia a brotherly love that is a love of affection of a brother we talk about not being uh, about being genuine and not being hypocrite. Now, the fervent love. Now, fervent means to like stretch out, to reach forward. And, oh, we're gonna get to that one. I'm getting ahead of myself here. It's a word, fervent means to stretch out. It's a reaching, it's active, it's in earnest, it's resolute, it's tense. And as we're talking about Baseball is like someone who's reaching to get the home base. You reach, or the per or the player reaching to catch the baseball. They reach out, and this is a fervent. So it's an active word. But then it uses this word, agabeo, or as we more commonly know, it's agape. And agape love is really a covenant love. If we were to simplify it, it means a covenant love, a love that you often think of between a husband and a wife should be an agape type love. Between a, 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 a parent and a child should have this agape love. And even to some degree, we have a, a I don't know about you, but I have agape love for our country. I love our country. And I have and I, 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 I have, I'm devoted to my country, not in, the, not in the sense of I'm worshiping the country, but there's a devotion. And, and this is a type of love. And, and I was, uh, me and my net were talking to someone else about this recently. And a great illustration, as we talked about not that long ago, was Ruth and Naomi. They had a agape love or a chesed love. And it's a defining of this loyalty love and it's not a verb, but a commitment. Like, like I said, a marriage is a commitment. And this is, he's saying, uh, you need to reach fervently in a covenant, committed relationship to your brothers and sisters in Christ. And by the way, agape love and this fervent love is key. Because if you didn't have agape love in your marriage, you probably still wouldn't be married. How many arguments have you had with your spouse? And if it wasn't for agape love, you'd be like, I'm out of here. But you said, no, I love them. I'm going to stay with them. 
Or how many of you have had children who they're being a pain in the neck? And there's nothing more you would like to do is say, get out of the house. And I don't know what else. No, you wouldn't do that. Say, I love you. I care about you. It's that covenant love that gets you to hang in there. What helps you as our nation goes off the rails into pagan society and that we can still love and have that covenant love is this a covenant love. We have this love for our nation. We're committed to our nation. And this is what is talking about the type of love we should have for one another in the body. Paul, Paul, Peter is telling us to earnestly act loving to one another in Christ. A beloved, the church family should be the place we actively seek to show our love to one another, even when we don't want to. Right? There's sometimes maybe you don't want to talk to that one person, but you you say no. I am to love that person in church, even if we don't always get along. We will still have a relationship because I am I am going to love them because they are my brother and sister. It should be a place even when people make mistakes. And do people make mistakes in the church? Oh, yes. And even when people make mistakes, you still act love, loving to them. That you don't just toss them aside and say, you failed, I want to throw you out. No, the church should be a place of a covenant love that even when they fail, you, you strive for reconciliation. You strive for forgiveness. There is love and mercy and compassion. And what gives us that BLD is that that's what Christ did for you on the cross. Because I'm a messed up person and you're a messed up person. Amen? And if it was anything but, but by the shore of the grace of God, we'd all go to hell. But because of God's mercy and grace and forgiveness, we can be reconciled. And if God did that for me and he did that for you, how much more should we do that for one another? That there isn't anyone in this church or any in the world, if Christ could die for his enemies and re us reconcile to him, how much more should we do that to one another? And, and, and to some degree, this is this agape, covenant, loving, Philadelphia love that Peter said we should have because of the gospel. Third, it goes into saying, talking about, oops, go back. All right, it talks about from the heart. It comes from the heart. Now, I want you to understand heart here because we've talked about a covenant commitment, a brotherly love, but from the heart takes it to another level because it comes from this word, kodia, and it means heart. And whenever you see the word heart in the Bible, you want to think of desires and emotions and affection. It's like that deep feeling of love for one another, that we desire to be with one another. We desire, we see someone and say, I love you. you and when you run to someone in Hannaford and say, oh, great, it's Steve, let's stay and talk. Or you see someone for true, you say, oh, this is great. And you, you, when you think about this person, oh, I want to pray for them or you have this great deep desire and love for them. And it's like as Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. In other words, our love is just not a stoic love. You know, the, in the past, that's probably one of the mistakes that as Baptists we miss, made a mistake. We had at one point a very stoic faith, a very unemotional faith. But throughout the scripture, it is filled with a deep emotional love. And that's one of the things we need to repent of. We need to repent of stoic love and have a love that is deep and emotional and it's based on the gospel. And, and this is what this word heart is. is a deep desire for one another. 
This is what he's talking about. And that leads to, as we go through this, it's like, that's great, Peter. But how does that work? I mean, this is, I love to have this kind of relationship. I love to, to have this brother love and have an authentic love for my brother. I like to have a fervent love, this agape love, this the, with emotion. But, but man, there's sometimes I don't want to love one another in church. There's sometimes where people give me angst in the church. Well, Peter, how do I do that? And this is where the word comes in and the gospel comes in because it's the only thing short of God's word and the gospel that can transform you from the inside out because it's not a natural thing. But as John MacArthur would say, it is a supernatural love for one another. It's a supernatural love. So let's look up the transforming word because this is the key for this effect. Verse 23 says, For you have been born again, not of a corruptible seed, but incorruptible. That is through the living and enduring word of God. What is Peter's point here? What does this have to do with loving another? Peter is talking about how we have been transformed by the word of God. Transformed by the gospel. Peter explained that we are not born, we are born again. We're not born again of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. We're not born of how our fathers or forefathers were. We're not born like the religious acts of this world. We're not born into the secular world that is corrupted and fallen apart. We're not born in sin, but we are born again sinless, righteous, godly. Into the children of God, we are a new creation. This is the living, enduring word of God that resides in each and one of you. And it's only through that that we can be changed. It is only that that we are made anew and afresh and that we can learn to love one another. We've been transformed by the incorruptible word of God. It changes how we love one another. And we cannot lie, love, uh, we cannot, it's only through Christ that this comes possible. We cannot love like the world loves for the love of the world is self-centered. The center on pleasure, pleasing itself, the world focus on center on, on what it desires. But as Peter, uh, Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says this. Do nothing. This is how we should love one another. Do nothing from selfish admission or vain glory. That's the world, right? The vain glory. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Now, just think about that. Regard one another as more important than yourself. There's nothing in the world that, that rubs against the world. The world says, no, it's all about you. It's all about you. Find your own self as Danny. And in the, and God's word says, no, it's not about you. It's about God and it's about them. You know, I always liked that great command. It said, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love others. You know, it never says, oh, by the way, love yourself. Do we have any problem with loving ourselves? Is this like an issue for most of us? Not really. And if, if anything, we need to learn what Philippians is saying here is to regard as people more important than yourself, that you are interested in the affairs of other people that you put aside your own plans and your own ideas aside to look towards your brothers and sisters in Christ, not merely looking out for your own personal interests, but also to the interests of others. That's not to say you should ignore your interests, that you should ignore feeding yourself, take care of your family, but their interest is as important as yours. So when our brothers and sisters are hurting, when they're going through a tough time, we don't say, sucks for them. I guess I'll just go home. No, 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 no. What, what Paul is saying here is when your brother hurts, you hurt. When your brother's going through tough times, you are now going through tough times because you're going to enter into that relationship and say, how can I come alongside you? How can I 
wrestle with you? How can I pray with you? How can we walk through the scare? You look out to the interests of others. And that's because you're getting a changed mind. You're no longer thinking the way the corruptible world thinks, but you're being transformed by the enduring word of God. Beloved, this is what Christ did for us. Jesus could have had a perfectly happy life in heaven. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit were up there in heaven and everything was wonderful. And they could look down and said, wow, that sucks down there. That was a mistake. You want to go down there? No. Okay, let's just stay here. No, God didn't do that. He said, I will go down there. I will go down there. I will get my feet wet and dirty and in the muck and I will sacrifice my life to redeem them. And that is the example we're seeing here, that this is what the incorruptible word of God does. He gets in and joins and redeems. And my, my thought is, who do we need in our lives, do we need to get in their muck and mire so we can redeem them? Who do you know that maybe you need to forgive? Who do you need to know that you need to get in there and re help redeem them? How can you be like Christ and not look to your interests but the interests of others? And we all know people like this, friends, family, and maybe there's old church members that also need some reconciliation and redeeming. And this is what God's word tells us to because we are to love them as our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, moving on, the enduring word. The enduring word. Verse 24, For all the flesh is like grass, and all its glory is like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is a word which is proclaimed to you as the good news or gospel. Peter here is quoting Isaiah 46 through 8. And if you have extra time, you can look it up. So Isaiah 4. In fact, I would encourage you to look at all Isaiah 40 because it's always the context of Isaiah 4 is this. Isaiah is preaching to Israel. Israel is gone off the deep end. And he's telling them to turn, repent. He's calling them, turn away from your idols. Turn away from your futile way. And said, fixate your eyes on the eternal word of God. It's that same idea of the focus on the incorruptible instead of the corruptible. And he's saying, you need to change. You need to redeem. And only the word of God, only God's word, only in Christ can they be redeemed. Only by believing in what God and putting their faith in God can they be redeemed. It's the same thing true for us. Beloved, God is faithful to his word. He's promising in this verse, if you look at it, he said, this is a promise. I promise you, my word is endure. It was faithful. It will succeed. And you can trust it. You can hold on to my promises. It will happen. And that's what the gospel is. He, he's given us a promise in his word. And, and, and what Peter's doing, he's echoing off of Isaiah 40 and pointing to Christ. Because Christ is the word of God, spoken and made flesh. He is the gospel. And part of the sanctification is the love for one another. As Christ renews you and transforms you, as we turn away from the corruptible ways of God to uh, the corruptible ways of this world and to the enduring and uh, uh, ways of God as God is working in our lives, it leads to us not only loving God and becoming obedient to God and being holy to God and so reverently fearing God, but it changes us to love one another. And this is a part of God's enduring word that we are to love one another. In fact, the idea of loving one another goes all the way 
back to Deuteronomy. We were called to love one another. That when Jesus said, love one another, he wasn't making a new, clan, a new command. It was an old command. He's just reiterating them. And in fact, he would iterate it to, a, uh, to the next level. The key for the, uh, therefore, when the key signs that you are a believer in Christ is that you love one another. If you do not love one another, as first, uh, uh, as uh, first John would there go and say, if you don't love one another, you don't love Christ. And if you don't love Christ, then you're not saved. One of the key signs is you should love one another. It's one of those sanctification. As, as much as a fruit of the Spirit is a character that should change you and redeem you and you have a new character, part of that is that you love one another. And you have been transformed by God's word. That is one of those things that God is sanctifying you in your life. And in fact, John 13, 35 would say, By this all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The key way that people, if they were people in the world, would see us, the key way to know that we are a Christian, that we are in Christ, that we are brothers and sisters in the Lord, is that, wow, they love one another. I mean, not, not kind of sort of love them. They really love one another. They're not just tolerating each other. They don't just show up to church on Sunday and it's nice club time. No, they love one another. They love spending time together. It's one of the, the, the wonderful things I see when I see members of church not just gather on church on Sunday and not just at the prayer group, but when I see them going over to each other's house or helping each other, or and you really see them loving one another and caring for another. And when they when we see someone who says, Man, they love each other. It's just not a temporary thing. It's just not a Sunday thing. It's a 24-7 thing, and that is a type of love that God is working in you. And it is a sign for the unbelievers to say they are a Christian. They are a believer because they love one another. I've often said that our love for in the church should be so great that when someone wants to walk in the door for the first time, and maybe they're not an unbeliever, and they, they, they're an unbeliever, and they see the love in the church, they should be like, wow, I don't know, not know what you guys got going on in here, but I want it. I want to be a part of this family because there's something special going on here, and I want to be a part of it. And that should be this, this great deep love for another. It should not be shaken but only build and strengthen. And it's that family, it, to some degree, it's exclusive because it's only for those in the church. But it's, a, it's exclusive, but we want to welcome anyone in. We want anyone to be enjoined into this family. It's an open family in the sense that we're welcoming, but it's a closed family because we are loving one each other and we love one another in ways that we don't love anyone else. And I don't know about you, but when I became a believer, when I became a Christ, to some degree, my church family, man, I love my church family to some degree more than I love my own parents. I don't know about you, but there's some way I love my church family better than my parents and better than my sibling. I love my brother. I love my parents, but my church family, I love them. And I, me and that have uh, my pastor from San Jose, they are my, I consider our true spiritual parents. And so we have her parents, we have my parents, and we have our spiritual parents. And I don't know about you, but that's, a, that's what happens. You end up in this family, God, and you end up with these family members and this love that's deeper because there's some things that my parents will never fully understand because they're not believers. And there's some things that her parents will never understand because they're not believers. But you understand it because you've been touched by God and so there's a deep love. You've been through what I did. You were redeemed like I was. And so it changes your love for one another. I just want to move forward and move into 
application here. I just skip ahead. So conclusion, application. So what should love for one another look like? Now, to some degree, we could look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you have time, I would encourage you to look at it. To some degree, we could take a look at Galatians 5, 22 to 23, which is the fruit of the Spirit. Another good passage to look at what does it mean to love one another. But instead, I want to look at a verse that Jesus said in John 13, 34. And in John 13, 34, he says, A new command I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And to, if you want to spend some time thinking about it many times, just think, how? How did Jesus love his disciples? He said, you 12, you've been around me. We've been ministering together for the last three years. How have I loved you? And how I have loved you, to love others. And I came up with a short list here. In no way is this comprehensive. One of the ways he, 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 he loved them, he chose them. He chose them. He said, Matthew, you're not doing anything, are you? Come on, join me. John, Peter, hey, I want to make you fishers of men. Come. And to some degree, when we see our brothers and sisters of Christ, say, yes, Bill, you're my brother. Doug, you're my brother. Tina, you're my sister. And we look at each person and say, yes, I choose you. You are my brothers and sisters in Christ. He teaches and guides them. That's one thing we should do as brothers and sisters. We teach and guide, and we read scripture, we pray together, we encourage her, we direct one another. Because I don't know about you, I don't have everything figured out. I know you think pre preacher man knows everything. And he's read the whole Bible, which I have, but I don't have everything figured out. I'm the first one to say, I don't know when I don't know. And we need brothers and sisters who, who are around us who can guide and direct us for wisdom and guidance especially because God's gifted them with talents that you don't have or I don't have. And so he teached them and he guided them and he protected them. When things came, when the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees came and attacked them, say, how dare your disciples eat grain or how dare they do this? What are your disciples doing? Just that uh, he stood in front of the Pharisees and said, said stop, they're mine. And let me tell you why you're wrong. And when the storm came, he protects them. He protected his disciples. And that's what we need to do in Christ. Like we were reading earlier, what Jackie Robinson, when a guy came and said, no, he's mine. Don't mess with him. He's my friend. Don't do that. And we need people around us who are going to protect us from people who could do us harm. Especially nowadays, that's going more likely more than others. Another one is he fed them and healed them. We need to care for their physical needs. He cared for the physical needs because you can't get to the spiritual things until you've taken care of the physical needs. And when our brothers and sisters have physical needs and uh, or even emotional needs, we need to go in there and come alongside them to help them as they struggle. He encouraged them and empowered them. He says, no, okay, I'm going to empower you by the Holy Spirit, and I want you to go out and preach the word. And, 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 and when Peter did something great, he was like, yay, Peter. When he didn't do so good, he said, Peter, what are you doing? And sometimes he warned him in advance, okay, Peter, I just want you to know, Satan's is going to sift you like sand, but I prayed for you. And then even when he says, you'll deny me three times, he was, he was it was, yes, a, a encouragement and a warning. And, and, and so we need someone. And then later on, Jesus goes to Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? Yeah. Feed my sheep. He says it three times. He recommissions Peter and encourages them, Peter, you're still my man. You're still going to be my man. I still need you to lead my sheep because I'm going, Peter. 
And we need to do that for one another. We need people come inside and say, you're, you can do it. I, I know you're the man. It's like often I have a Richard or other people I say, Richard, I want you to lead the youth group. And here, you're the man. You're going to take over for me. You can do it. And we need to have a relationship that where we're building up and edifying one another because we get beat down enough, right? And we need someone who can pick us up and encourage us and help move us forward. He forgave them. Oh, how much do we need forgiveness from one another? We mess up. The church messes up. And when we mess up, we need to say, I'm sorry, forgive me. And when someone says, forgive me, you need to say, I forgive you. Because Christ forgave you. Jesus was always offered forgiveness to all that was willing to receive it. And we need to forgive one another as Christ forgave us. He was patient. We need to be patient with each other. How often are we not patient? We're like, ah, oh, that's it. I'm done with them. I'm not going to deal with it anymore. We need to be patient. It's like a child when you train the, a child up. Man, they don't figure out potty training. I'm tell you this, Joshua's potty training. I'm learning a new level of patience. But the same patient I have for Joshua, we should have patient for one another because we're going to mess up in the church and we're going to hurt people's feelings in the church. And at that moment, there is going to be a need for forgiveness and mercy and grace, and we should offer it freely. He loved them sacrificially. There, he held nothing back to the point where he washed his disciples' feet, took off his robe, got down, and washed their dirty feet. Even Judas, just think about it, he washes Judas' feet, the guy who's going to betray him. He loved them sacrificially to a point where he died on the cross for their sins and ours as well. And so we learn something about what Love is by just looking at, at the life of Jesus. And I encourage you, spend this week, think about, meditate. How did Jesus love his disciples? And how we can learn how to love one another from that example. As God loves his 12 disciples, we are to love one another in a deep, commit love. But always love, always give. It's a kind of love. That when we hear about someone you know, wood chopped for their house, a group of guys from the church on Wednesday and Saturday get together and chop some wood. It's a type of church that when we hear about someone having financial needs in the church, we say, yes, we'll help you with that. It's a type of church that when, we, when someone says, I just need someone to listen to me, I just need someone to cry on my shoulder, that the church says, yes, we'll listen and cry on our shoulders. It's a type of church that says we are ready and always willing to forgive sins and move to reconcil reconciliation. It's a kind of love that seeks to do what is best for everyone is a kind of love that invites people to their house and be hospitable with a meal and time and joy and laughter. It's a kind of love that sacrificial gives time, money, and effort for the needs of others in the church because we love one another. And the key to that is because Jesus Christ did it for us. And as he did it for us, as he sanctified us, let us do that for one another. Uh, I'll just say a quick little thing. I was reading this thing in the Sunday school times and it was talking about this one guy who came to the United States and saw things and he saw the fellowship of this area that he went to and he described fellowship was so wonderful that he would pull on the string of people and it would just lead to one 
brother and sister Christ, to another brother and sister Christ, to brother and sister Christ, to brother and brother. That, that is the type of love that when we love, that we are a family. That if someone say, so tell me about your church, you say, oh, let me tell you about my brother Brett. Let me tell you about Michael. Let me tell you about Trampus. Let me tell you about Art Roy. Let me tell you about this people. Because oh, how I love them, and oh, how the fellowship, and oh, how deep their love is for another. And that is what we should see in the church If you like these videos, please like, share, subscribe, and ring that bell. God bless you, and have a good day.